Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 21st, 2024 Scarborough Board of Education business meeting. Can we have the attendance, please? Sure. Mrs. Gammon? Here. Ms. Casalonis? She's been excused. Mr. Kelleher? Here. Ms. Leong? Here. Ms. Lindstrom? Here. Ms. Tarpinian? Here. Ms. Trapini Huff? Here. Ms. Leisure? Here. And Mr. Shumway? Here. Perfect. Would everyone please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Agenda item 4.0 is approval of the meeting minutes from February 26, 2024, and March 7, 2024. If there are no objections, you can approve these unanimously. All right, hearing none, the minutes from many meeting minutes from February 26, 2024 and March 7th, 2024 are approved. Um, agenda item 5.0 are adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments this evening? No adjustments. Perfect. Agenda item 6.0 is the spotlight recognition. So for this, I'll turn it over to Jenna. Yes. So for this month's spotlight award, I am pleased to announce that we have two winners and they are... Megan Haley and Michelle LaJoy. Am I saying that correct? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go into a little detail. So Megan and Michelle were nominated last year for their innovative and inspirational project with Spillway and Scotty, a dog and his boy at the K2 schools. So let's find out who nominated them. And it was Renee Richardson. <laughs> um, so Renee, I'll invite you to come up. Um, Diana, if you don't mind going to the next slide, because I think Renee will have some things to say about this. So not that I can see them all that well, but the pictures that you see are from the event that um, happened at Pleasant Hill School when, um, well, I'll get into a little more detail, but the authors, the characters uh, from the book, um, A Dog and His Boy, were invited to come to our school. Um, Megan and Michelle worked together to bring Heidi Bullen, the author, by characters from the book. This is the book. A boy and his dog, or sorry, I said it backwards, a dog and his boy, um, to see our students last spring. First of all, that was exciting for them because all the students had heard this story in their classrooms. They had made pictures of Scotty and Spillway the dog, um, and they were really involved in learning about the things that Scotty could do. Also, at this event that we had, um, Lisa and Scott Wenzel, the parents of Scotty and Spillway. Um, so the project that they worked on was to get each student one of these books to take home and to bring this to life for them in an assembly. And it was an outstanding experience. Our students learned about the love that Scotty and Spillway have for each other and how important it is to include people with different abilities in the things we do. They were so excited to, to not only learn about Scotty and Spillway, but they got to meet them in person. And the first slide on the left is Scotty behind the, I believe, his dog, and some of our students stopping to say hello. Um, the picture now that you see the arrow on is the other part of this really exciting assembly. And the basic reason that got me um, to have to say something and nominate them. You see members from our very inclusive buddy system group from the high school are in the background there. They came to share their experiences at the high school 
and what it feels like to include others in your group. I was um, connected to some students in the buddy system. When I was teaching at the high school, I was very, very excited to see Nick as one of the attendees at that assembly and um, to see all the students I had known who were really enjoying being a part of all this. I think in the final slide, you see one of our students stopping by to talk to Scotty, and I think that's Megan Haley smiling in the background. <laughs> um, so I, I think I just paraphrased what I have written down, but I did want to add that the primary age students learned so much about inclusion and loved the books that they got to take home. One boy, at the time I wrote this, I said one boy already told us that he wants to be to he wants to be in the buddy system group when he gets to high school. And he was only in second grade. So that was a very big goal for him. So I thought it was really fitting that this acknowledgement goes to Megan and Michelle, and especially this month, actually, because this is recognized as diversity month. So thank you for all that you do. So in our next slide, there's actually a picture of the, the book that Ms. Renee Richardson just brought in. Um, the little synopsis is, no matter where they go, Scotty and his special stuffed dog, Spillway, always have fun together. Although Scotty was born with a chromosomal disorder that causes developmental delays, with Spillway by his side, there are always adventures to be had. Join Spillway as he takes you on a journey through Scotty's life where they experience acceptance, empathy, and inclusion, inclusion during their unique time together. And then in the next slide, we have a video that was featured on New Center, Maine about this specific event that Ms. Richardson has spoken about. And finally this evening, a unique bond between a young man with special needs and his life-size stuffed dog is coming to life on the pages of a children's book. A Dog and His Boy, The Adventures of Spillway and Scotty was published last month. And since then, Scotty Winsel's family has been on a mission to get that book and its message of acceptance of all people of all abilities into elementary schools and libraries, not only in Maine, but worldwide. New Center Maine's Vivian Lee has more from Scarborough. It's a story about a unique friendship, one that has no limits. When we go riding horses, he brings me right along. A Dog and His Boy, The Adventures of Spillway and Scotty is a rhyming book featuring colorful pictures by Maine illustrator Claudia Diller. Today, 300 students at Pleasant Hill Elementary School, along with members of Scarborough High School's Buddy System program, went along for the ride of Spillway's life with Scotty Wenzel by his side. But right before we go to sleep, we party and we play. Scotty, who's already had a lifetime of heart surgeries, has Dubowitz syndrome. The extremely rare chromosomal disorder causes physical and developmental delays. Scotty started therapy at a very young age. His parents also immersed him in activities from skiing and riding horses to surfing. And ever since his mother Lisa brought home this life-size stuffed dog, the two have never been apart. Lisa wrote the book with Heidi Bullen, a longtime friend, a third grade teacher, and a children's book author. Their goal, teaching kids at an early age that they have the same dreams and aspirations as people of all abilities. They want the same things as they do. They want friends. They want to be included in, their, in work and play and in the community. Ski, Scotty can ski. They water ski, Scotty can water ski. They ride horses, Scotty can ride horses, you know, and to make that connection. Scotty and Spillway also made an appearance. Scotty, who is nonverbal, showed how he communicates using this special device. Hi, Heidi, I love you. <laughs> A message of empathy and inclusivity that's heading home for these youngsters. It doesn't matter if you have a disability. It just matters if you have friends. They're not 
the same as you. They still, they still are a part of this world. Scotty's family is going on the road taking the book to kids across Maine. Crescent Park Elementary School, where Bolin teaches, bought 300 of them. 700 more will be given to elementary school children in Scarborough. Now, Maine businesses are stepping up in a big way to share Spillway and Scotty's message of acceptance. CMP plans to distribute 600 copies of the book in libraries and schools in its service area. And you can find a dog and his boy on the shelves at L.L. Bean. But Lisa isn't stopping till the book goes across the globe. We're hoping to get on the Today Show or and any any news, big news affiliates and just get the word out there. Inspiring the next generation that welcomes everyone, no matter their differences. In Scarborough, Vivian Lee, New Center, Maine. By the way, a, pro, a percentage of the proceeds from the sale of that book will be donated to the nonprofit Scotty is involved with. If you'd like more information on how to get a copy, you can head to our website or our New Center Main app. Yeah, so I thought that was really awesome. And I actually recall seeing Scotty and Spillway at uh, when we celebrated Unified Sports. So yes. mm -hmm. I think we were they were auctioning some of the books off, and I mm -hmm. believe. Um, he was well recognized by a bunch of the kids, especially my own my own kids. He was like, "That's Scotty and Spillway," <laughs> and definitely tried to win the book. We didn't win the book, at least not to my knowledge. But uh, <laughs> definitely, he already has a copy, but he wanted another. So, congratulations! So, I would like to come have you guys come up, and you also, Miss Renee. And then, can you go to the next slide? And finally, this evening, and you need. Yay! She's coming. <laughs> Can you guys come up too? And then everyone come for a photo. Thank you. I didn't have enough hands. All right, are there any comments for our winners? That was really awesome. Thank you, Renee, for for recognizing them and thank you for coming and for doing all of this hard work. That's really amazing. So thank you so much. And it's an especially fun night because tonight is our winter sports recognition, which is why there's so many kids in the room. So um, I'm sure some of them, um, if they didn't cross paths with you as a student, perhaps they remember I see some waving. Perhaps they remember you from their time there. So this is a, to me, this is a pretty cool moment. It's like a, a full circle. So if you are interested in staying, we are going to move into the winter rec recognition next. Um, but if not, if yeah, please feel free to, to, um, to go. But uh, agenda item 67.0 is the winter sports recognition. So for this, I will invite Mike Legage to the front. Okay, good evening, and thank you for having us again. And uh, I want to get right to it because I know you have a full agenda. So we're going to introduce Coach Conley with boys basketball. So first of all, I want to introduce my two captains, um, Liam Jeffords and Liam Garrett. They were two-year captains for us, junior and senior year. Uh, did a great job. 
for our program. This year, uh, we had a wonderful season. Uh, we finished with a record of 16 wins and five losses, um, and we lost in the regional final to Gorham. We also had eight players make the SMA All-Star team, whether that's first team, second team, honorable mention, and all academic. Um, we had such a successful season um, because of our team culture. Um, if any of you saw us play, you, you would witness the guys on the court playing for each other. Um, and that, that process started last summer in June and July uh, in our summer league when we worked out three days a week. Uh, we'd have meetings. Uh, we played uh, two nights a week. We went to a team camp, uh, Gold Rush at Thomas College, uh, overnight for a couple nights, and we had meetings about you know, how we wanted our season to go and we wanted to play for each other. Uh, and when the season started, uh, we had a team meeting uh, in our team room, and each player had to bring two standards with them that they wanted uh, for our team so that we could have a successful team. And so everyone brought two, and then we decided on five team standards. Um, as a group, we voted on them. It was, uh, and we followed them this year, you know, in and out of school, practice, and in games. Um, and, you know, we, a couple of things that, like we did after every practice, after every practice, I would bring the guys in and would, um, and would say storm on three. Um, but then after, um, we did that, everyone gave gratitude to each and every single teammate, um, for that day. They, uh, they thanked their teammates for working hard, um, and competing and making them better and making our team better. Um, they did that after a game. Um, so we gave gratitude, which I thought was really, really important, and it helped with our team culture. Um, so it was just, you know, uh, an outstanding season. Uh, we were one game short from a regional title, um, but in my 28 years coaching high school basketball, this team um, displayed the best team culture that I've ever had, um, and that says a lot because of our leadership. Our, you know, the eight seniors that we had were a big part of that. We're going to continue that. Uh, going forward as well, but we just had a tremendous season. So thank you very much. And Coach Whitmore with the girls basketball. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very proud to represent girls basketball um, for head coach uh, Mike. Giordano, who's uh, one of the finest, and um, the second port part of um, our coaching staff, uh, Lisa has been uh, an amazing source for our young girls uh, in being able to put them in a position where they understand better what they're doing and how to handle things because she was th through everything in her career. Um, as we began the season, um, we had almost totally different from Phil. We had one senior and we had six juniors, four sophomores, and two first years. And our captains were uh, Emerson Flaker, who was a junior, and Caroline Hartley, who was a senior. And we played very well throughout the season. Uh, we ended up getting to the finals of um, Southern Maine, uh, didn't win uh, the final game, and um, that was disappointing. But what our girls accomplished as a team was very special because we, uh, we ended up I think, as one of the top teams in Maine, and, and that aspect of it was uh, a product of their capability of being able to put things together um, on the physical and emotional side. Um, at the end of the season, um, Caroline and Emmy were named first, all, first team all SMAA. Um, Emmy was all defensive team. Um, Caroline was named to the um, McDonald's All-Stars and was one of the final three for Miss Basketball in Maine. Um, and uh, more so than anything else, um, I've been fortunate to coach uh, for six decades, and 
this group was as together as any group that I've ever coached, and it was a pleasure to be with them all during the course of the season. Thank you. Coach McCormick, the Unified. I am uh, Albert McCormick. I've got Nick Veyu and Josh Meserve here, some of our veteran um, teammates. Uh, we had uh, a year that is going to be hard to beat. We're going to try. Um, but uh, it was filled with a ton of just amazing moment, moments from um, the uh, National Champions banner celebration that was mentioned earlier. That was a really amazing event. Um, we had uh, the first ever buzzer beater winner from Mr. Veyu right here, which was really, um, <laughs> it was, uh, it was an amazing moment to watch that and the team just, it was a true buzzer beater shot. We won, what was it, 52, 51 to South Portland and having the entire team crash the court and just, ugh, it was amazing to be a part of that. Um, and it was uh, great coaching from one of our players, Jaden Guerra, who called the timeout when I was just standing there waiting, you know, waiting to see what happened. <laughs> and uh, we drew up a play, and it was just phenomenal. So um, really, it was an amazing season. I think uh, a big part of it was it was just great basketball. I talked about a moment with uh, playing Gorham, and one of the Gorham teammates came up to me and was like, you guys are really good. I, couldn't, I, didn't, I didn't even know where the ball was half the time. We're passing around. We've got a lot of uh, people that have been on this team for a while now, and uh, it's really starting to show. It's making my job a lot easier, and um, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm happy to be part of the ride. So we got a great crew, and looking forward to bocce, bocce season as always. But uh, it was uh, it was it was one for the books for sure. And Coach Watson with wrestling. Our senior captain, Miguel Torres, was here representing. Uh, the other two were unable to make it. In terms of team duel wins and losses, we did not shatter any records. Uh, <clears throat> however, it's the largest amount of wrestlers I've had on a team since I took the program over three years ago post-COVID. So knowing that wrestling today's world is not overly popular anymore and having to take a whole season off due to COVID, We've kind of been rebuilding. We started with 10, we're up to 25, and I believe next year we should be close to 30. Um, having said that though, we did have <clears throat> senior Luke Burns. We are co-op with Gorham. He was our 190 pounder this year. He won the Class A South State Championship. He was the first two-time state champion in program history since Scarborough, Gorham, or both wrestled. He was the third wrestler to ever achieve 100 wins, which is a giant milestone. If you don't know wrestling, 100 career varsity wins is really huge. It's even a bigger deal because he did it in three seasons instead of four. And we're still waiting on him to commit, but there's the potential that he'll be only the second wrestler to ever go D1 out of our program. So. Overall, good season, lots of new faces, lots of first-year wrestlers. Um, and I told the story at the banquet, and then I'll get done. We had a ton of new kids that had never done this before. Our first dual meet, one of the little guys went out on the mat. His headgear was on backwards. I think his singlet might have been backwards. Um, <laughs> at the end of the year at regionals, in the consolation semifinals, he won a match. And it was like his third victory ever. So. We're getting there. Thank you. And cheering. Cheering is nice. I think both of our coaches are here, so that's great. Come on up. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Laveri. I'm the head coach for Varsity Cheer. Um, this is Katie Reed, our assistant coach. 
We didn't have captains for this season, but we did bring along sophomore Lorelai Noonan and freshman Emily Silver to represent our team tonight. Uh, we had a very successful season. The team placed top five at several of the competitions this season and top six at regionals, which advanced us to the state championship. Um, we had a very young team this season with 75% of our athletes being freshmen and some of those being completely brand new to cheer, which was really awesome. Um, this season, we focus a lot on sportsmanship and uplifting each other through team building during our practices and when we were at competitions. Um, our athletes came up with ideas weekly to support other teams that we compete against as well as each other. We made goodie bags for other teams, letters of encouragement, which is, I think, one of our favorite things that we did for other teams, um, and many others as well. Um, we were really excited to end this year for the winter cheer season, receiving the Sportsmanship Award for Class A South. Um, and along with having three of our athletes being chosen for the SMA All-Stars and having two honorable mentions as well. So it was a really great season. And Coach Gennard with Boys Ice Hockey. Hi everyone, I'm here today with a couple of my seniors that I had on the team. I'm the assistant coach, by the way. I'm not the head coach. Um, but I have Olin Pedersen, Ryan Ravis, and Tyler Kenny. Um, shout out to Kyle, Tyler Kenny, he, had the, he was awarded the first team All-State um, for a forward, so that was great. In terms of the season, how it went, fell a bit short of expectations in terms of not making the playoffs, but on the flip side, I'm extremely proud of how, how hard the guys worked coming into practice every day. You know, we had different fluctuating practice times in the morning, sometimes late at night, practicing on Saturday, sometimes early on Saturdays. So that was great. Um, we have a really good young group of guys, really good sophomore class in our starting goalie towards the end of the year was a freshman. So I think things are going to turn around for next year, and I'm really, I'm really proud of them, especially with the JV team. We won the state championship for JV. So that was great. Um, and the season, I think, was really good. Everybody was really happy to come into practice every day, and everyone was super positive. Um, even with like the losses we had and a lot of heartbreaking losses, a lot of one goal games that we didn't come away with. But other than that, I think the season was great. I'm really proud of how hard everybody worked and I'm really excited for next year, especially with the young group of guys we have. So thank you. And Coach Veyu, boys indoor track. Good evening. Uh, congrats to uh, all the uh, winter sports teams out there. So I got to see a, a bunch of games, and it's always good to see uh, highly uh, competitive uh, athletes go at it. And uh, you know, we had a lot of lot of success uh, across the board for all our winter teams. Uh, boys, for boys indoor track, we have uh, five of our captains here: senior John Reed, uh, junior Baxter Merriam, senior Nolan Badger. Junior Sam Asia and Junior Nicholas Cozil. Um, we have a big squad. That's why we have so many captains. 62 athletes this year, which was uh, I think the most we've ever had uh, for indoor, and that included uh, 19 freshmen. So uh, a healthy amount of young mixed with uh, experience, and it's always interesting. Um, you know, with our practice, we practice in hallways and outside during the winter. So it's uh, not the easiest, but uh, this group. Um, did well again. I mean, um, coming into this season, you know, expectations were to contend for a state title. So we'd won seven in a row. Um, put together a 15 and two regular season. Um, so I think we're you know, fifth in the uh, Southwesterns. And then at the state meet, um, we competed very well. Um, and it takes luck to win at a state championship. Uh, you got to have things go your way. And, uh, you know, one of our top athletes got. Uh, freakishly injured in the hurdles and couldn't compete in his event and we had a disqualification as well which cost us a bit um, if those things don't happen we're probably right in the mix to win it but uh, you know as they say uh, you can't win them all uh, I think those lessons are good to learn uh, you know everybody here put in the best effort but uh, it just didn't work out um, 
Um, but we had a lot to uh, be proud of. We had uh, three individuals on the all-conference team in the uh, all-conference 4x8 relay as well. Um, our seniors excelled in the classroom, seven of them on the all-academic team. And uh, we also had uh, a relay and two individuals advanced to the uh, New England Championship, as well as several uh, three athletes advanced to the uh, Nationals. So. Um, an outstanding season. It didn't end how we wanted, but uh, we'll take a, we'll take those lessons uh, learned and uh, move forward. And uh, looking forward uh, to the future. And uh, thanks to all our seniors. And girls into a track. Coach Curry. Hi, I want to introduce Kylie Record. She's uh, one of my senior captains out of the five. She came tonight, so that's good for Kylie. Um, we do, you know, like Derek said, we do have a big squad, so that's why we have five captains, 17 events. Um, Kylie is head of our distance squad. She scored 13 points for us at the state meet, and she also qualified for New England. Um, our season went really well. We weren't sure at the beginning how well it was going to go, but um, I had eight seniors earning all-conference academic while being role models for the underclassmen. Um, they were very consistent at practice, always helping the underclassmen, putting a lot of work in. We resulted in 18 state qualifiers out of the 45 girls on the team, which benefited us. Um, our team was three and two for the regular season. Um, some of the other squads had some big junior divisions, uh, so we'd lose by a couple of points, but nobody really got discouraged. Third at the SMAA championship, but uh, the girls won the state title, so it was pretty exciting. They were the underdog to Bangor, which we lost to last year, so they were pretty determined. Um, they really put the team in teamwork, and they all, everyone contributed. It wasn't like we didn't have like one champion title, everybody each scored some points in their events um, to help us get the title. So it was a really good season. Thank you. And boys and girls swimming. I think both of our coaches are here for that too. Yeah, they Hi, I'm Coach Royal. Um, this is Assistant Coach Sam McFord, and then we have Owen, Megan, Haniel, and Ryan. We are just missing one captain, Nadia, tonight, who's not feeling well. Um, we had an amazing season. As you guys know, our boys clinched their third state title, um, which is amazing. They put in a lot of work for that. And then our girls went to states with only four qualifying swimmers and managed to come out ninth place out of 23 teams with only four swimmers that had individual events. So they uh, they did some amazing things this season. I actually asked um, our captain, Owen, if he'd like to say something tonight because he's much more articulate than me. And I'm going to let him talk to you for a little bit. <laughs> The sport of swimming is such an amazing and beautiful environment. Part of that beauty is just how competitive the sport really is. Now, if you asked me a year ago how you, I thought we'd do at States this year, I definitely wouldn't say we'd do first. Even if you asked me a few months ago, I would have been very hesitant. But... The morning of states, I woke up, rolled out of bed, hopped on that bus, and I looked around, and I knew we were taking first. The desire and determination of that team was unlike anything I've ever seen before. In the past years, we've smoked the opponents. The second we showed up, the meet was over. But not this year. This year we hopped, this year we arrived, and we fought for it. And that's exactly what we did. We took first. I'll be honest, as much fun as winning is, nothing compares to the moments you spend with your teammates. Those are the moments that really matter. The sport of swimming is such an amazing and beautiful environment, and the irony in that is swimming really has nothing to do with it. It's the team and how every single time one of us hopped off those blocks, we weren't swimming for ourselves or even our coaches, but we did it for our teammates 
We did it for each other. That trophy wouldn't be, that trophy wouldn't be ours right now if it wasn't for every last one of those swimmers. We came together and we became one. I told you, that's why. <laughs> um, we had a great season, so I'm very proud and privileged to coach this team, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. I didn't forget anybody, did I? Okay. Well, thank you once again for having us. I think you heard a lot of wonderful things and uh, the level of student commitment it takes to participate in after school activities um, is really enormous with balancing both a rigorous academic schedule um, and an athletic schedule and to meet those achievements that they, they did are exciting. I think you heard a lot about uh, and Coach Conley spoke about giving gratitude and team standards and cheering with the Sportsmanship Award and the students that made our all-academic team. Um, those are uh, really big achievements and not easy to come by and just takes a lot of commitment and effort. So really proud of our coaches and our student athletes that are involved in our programs. Our number, participation numbers were really good this year, um, a little bit higher than last year at this time um, for winter sports. So we keep kind of making gains there. Even though our, our overall student enrollment is kind of leveling out, it's, uh, we seem to be um, continuing to have some growth in our, in our programs, which is exciting. So I think that's it, unless you had questions or? Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? I, I said this the last time, but um, just hearing you folks talk tonight, just young adults, and you're growing, and you're learning, and I just love that you put, you know now at this age, the work and the dedication it takes to succeed. And sometimes you succeed, sometimes, sometimes you don't. But there's lessons to be learned in that, and there's so much value in that as well. But I love that you fought for it, you worked for it, you earned it. And uh, congratulations to everyone on a very successful season. All right, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much um, for your participation and your dedication. I mean, I Carolyn said it beautifully, so I don't feel like I can, you said it beautifully. <laughs> I don't know that I could say much more on top of that, but I also want to, oh, and thank you for your, your speech. That's the first time we've ever had a student speak to us. And so that's really, really special. And the, the time you took to write that and to share that with us, that's, it's beautiful. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, but it's, it, I think to Carolyn's point, everything you learn and all of these lessons that stack up on top of each other, you're young and it's hard to look in the future and know what, that you're gonna look back on these moments right now and these are the things you're gonna remember. Yeah, you might have lost one or two here and maybe it didn't go the way you wanted, but the lessons and the teammates and the friendships that you built are the things that you're gonna look back at and that you're gonna be really, really proud of. It's the standards that you're coming up with. It's the norms you're creating. It's the being grateful for your teammates and being grateful for those that aren't your teammates that are actually your competitors, but still saying, hey, I really appreciate you and I recognize your hard work. Those are the really special things. So thank you. And thank you to the coaches for constantly upholding these values for the kids. I know, thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, um, we'll give you a minute. Um, if you would love to stay and hear about our budget, we would love to have you. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time. No? That didn't sell it? <laughs> no? I'm sorry, Kate. What's this, what's this like?
Yeah, if you're there, job, you're there. But if you're not there, <laughs> all right. Um, agenda item 8.0 is general public comment. Is there anyone wishing to make public comment tonight? No? Hearing none, we'll, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Agenda item 9.0 is new business. 9.1 is FY25 school budget presentation. Um, so for this, I'll invite Kate Bolton, the Director of Business and Finance, up. Hi guys, Hi. it's been such a long time since I spent time with you this week. There's this really wild howling wind back here. If I start to shiver, um, well, throw me a blanket. So we're here to talk about the budget. This is, this is so exciting. Um, Diane, are you on slides? Well, well, kick me off, go for it. Um, so tonight we're at the first reading of the school board's budget. Um, the Leadership Council has prepared a budget proposal for the board. Um, we spent uh, about seven hours so far this week going through the budget proposal uh, with the leadership team and the school board together in a couple of workshops. And uh, we're happy to be here towards the end of the week to wind things up the first week of the budget process. Tonight, the Leadership Council's proposal is taken forward by the school board. Um, school board passes the budget in first reading and then the work really begins where we dig in and, and uh, find a way to craft a proposal that makes its, all, makes its way all the way through the town council second reading and budget referendum. Uh, the town and school budget together, the municipal budget, will be presented by the town manager and superintendent next Wednesday, March 27th. And I'll keep bringing up dates at the end of this slides. There's, I'm like calendar girl, so there's uh, reminders all the way through here. Um, and in between now and the school board's second reading and the town council's second reading and budget being taken forward, um, we'll be making adjustments, um, we talk about items in motion. I'll use that phrase a couple of times where um, things that are in the budget right now may change due to outside circumstances. The school board finance committee was gonna have their first uh, budget related or budget review session on Monday. Also in the calendar, we'll be reminded many times. Um, and the communication committee, the school board's communication committee, um, also kicks in and, and uh, works on getting material out to the public um, in these meetings and many budget-related meetings and other ways of communication. Um, the school budget proposal will be refined and brought forward for second reading. And our goal is always to balance resources here in the town with the needs of our students. So some promotional materials. Um, this is actually a live link if you happen to be looking at the slide deck online after this meeting or during this meeting. Um, this takes you to the school board's budget page, which is on our website. Um, right now, posted up on the web page, we have the budget book, which is a 80-page document filled with all kinds of information about the budget proposal for this year. It includes these things you see here, the superintendent's introduction and executive summary. If all you really wanna take a look at is a capsule summary of the budget um, and some summary slides that show, uh, tables that show the budget itself, um, that's a great place to start. Lots of stories and information from each school each phase, each department, line item budget detail, if you are a spreadsheet geek and you wanna read individual accounts information. Um, Carolyn's smiling, yes, that, that is me. Um, six or 700 individual accounts there for you to play with. And the appendix, which includes some additional resources. Um, the appendix has 
I think some pretty interesting things in it. It has a full staff list. Um, it has a full description of all the capital budget, which we'll talk about in a minute. It has an enrollment study summary that's um, not the full enrollment study because we figured 100 pages might be a bit much, but uh, the superintendent put together a really nice analysis of that. Um, and it has some student data, um, a presentation that was done for the board um, a couple of months ago that I think is also very informative. So I want people to take a look at that. I know if anyone's bored, that's a great place to go. And we'll continue to post on that website all throughout the process. So tonight, we'll just call out a few of the high points, the major themes. I want to say that the, um, the budget slide deck and the agenda are both on the um, on the website already from the workshops this week. And the video streams are on the school board page and I'm gonna borrow them and post them over to the budget page as well. Um, so here we'll just hit a few, few high points. Um, cost drivers, what makes our budget the way it is? We're a people organization. Um, we are here for our staff and our budget reflects that. A little over 80% of our budget costs are made up of human beings, so salaries, wages, and benefits. We have collective bargaining agreements for almost all of our employees, which means um, employment contracts. And this year we have three contracts, three bargaining units whose contracts are under negotiation. So in that case, what we do is put an estimate into the budget that gives the board the resources to enter into those negotiations and be able to um, create new wage and salary tables. We have an estimate for health insurance rates um, at a, a rate increase that we guess might be 8%, um, which is based on some prior year numbers, averages of what we've um, received in increases in the past several years. We will know the truth of that in another couple of weeks because we'll get our rates for next year from Anthem, but we have a guess right now. And the other item that's, uh, it's a new item in salaries and benefits, is a program for paid family medical leave that the state of Maine has created through legislation. And it's in the process of being developed right now by the Department of Labor. We don't know all the answers about it, um, but we have been advised that we should budget some funds for it because it's expected to begin in January of 25, and there will be an expectation that employers will pay to the state um, a portion of people's salaries in order to kick off this program and make it available to employees. Uh, then we have non-personnel expenditures. We do have some things that we pay for that are not people. Um, we make budget estimates for these types of things, and, and there, there are a number of factors that are shown here that actually impact our thoughts about what those numbers are going to look like next year. Um, this doesn't actually talk about what we're spending the money on, but it speaks to the factors that we have to consider in our budget development. So enrollment coming back, enrollment continuing to grow, that's been a big story Social emotional needs of students, um, still talking about the pandemic impacts and some learning gaps, need for academic support, um, academic and social emotional supports have been very strong for our students. And then this is a staff, uh, staff bullet point too, that the labor market makes it difficult for us to hire um, in a number of areas, we have difficulty hiring, and that's something that the board has heard an awful lot about this week. So here's my phrase, items in motion. And um, when I say that, I'm, I'm speaking of, of changes that we're going to make to the budget because when we start putting the budget out, because the town charter and the school board policy says we have to get our budget process started at this time of year in order to have time to go through all the bits and pieces of the procedures that we need to do, there are things that we don't know yet. 
And so, as I said, we have an estimate in the budget to cover what we think the change in Anthem health insurance cost is going to be, but we won't know the answer to that for real for another couple of weeks. But we will before the second reading. And before second reading, we'll also know where our Delta dental insurance rates will be and other insurance premiums, workers' comp, property casualty liability. Um, so a lot of these answers will be coming to us and we can adjust our budget estimates accordingly. Um, I have the state paid medical leave on this list as well. The Department of Labor is in the middle of all kinds of processes, public hearings, um, webinars and committee work, and they're trying to figure out how to make this new system a reality. Um, so we're expecting to get all kinds of guidance as we continue through the budget process. I don't think they'll be done by the time we have second reading, but we're hoping to have a little bit more clarity on what we should actually be budgeting for. Um, for special education costs, um, my colleague Chris stayed awake long enough to come tonight. Uh, you heard from him earlier this week about the fact that they go through a significant amount of um, sort of fact finding and analysis for the students that are gonna be joining us next year. And um, during the course of the months that we have between first reading and second reading, we're often able to learn more about those students and what resources they might need, which could impact our second reading budget. And then the final bullet is about um, the fact that we continue to get quotes from vendors over the next couple of months saying, hey, here's your renewal rate for whatever that service or software might be. Um, and so we can incorporate those into where we had, had it, once had an estimate, we'll have a real number. So I think Jeff calls this my favorite slide. Um, or maybe I call it my favorite slide and he agrees with me. I like this slide because it talks about um, the fact that the Leadership Council doesn't just take this year's budget and say, well, let's just you know add 3% or let's just put a little more money in. Um, this team goes line by line through all of their accounts to try to figure out places where they can not only add but reduce. And knowing that our personnel costs are going to increase because salaries go up and benefit costs usually go up. They look for ways to find reductions in other areas that might potentially offset that um, expected increase. So here you see a few of the items that they um, looked at, turned over. Um, we'll talk about personnel uh, again in another bullet. Uh, another slide, uh, but these are a few things that we looked at where we actually reduced the amount that was in individual accounts, including that last bullet, which is $92,000 of just, let's take a little bit out of this line, let's reduce this line a little bit. And again, we have six or 700 accounts to look at, so. Busy times. Uh, so the next couple of slides talk about adding to the budget, and the Leadership Council also has a very deliberate, multi-stage process of determining what items to bring forward to add to what we consider to be level services. Level services means whatever we're doing today, the same programs, same services that we're offering to students, what will the cost for that be next year? So kind of status quo budget. New proposals add to that. And there are a couple of different kinds of new proposals. One is um, what you'd call required or mandatory. And this first bullet is one of those where we have students who are coming into our district that we know about and we know that they need services and they, they need a one-to-one -one ed tech. So we have money in the budget that allows us to hire those folks to serve those students. The second type of new proposals or new investments are the kinds of investments that help us meet the goals that the district has set for itself in terms of improvement, in terms of delivery of services to students, in terms of inclusion, in terms of curriculum. Um, these proposals are vetted through 
the leadership team. There's generally a lot more talked about than actually makes it into the budget. Um, but they're prioritized and the top priority items are brought forward and put into the budget proposal. So these uh, bullets that you see here and then on the next slide or the slide are going to be the, the items that the leadership team felt the most strongly about that they would be the most important items to serve the needs of our students. I'm going to make everyone read the slides themselves. <laughs> so again, there are required investments. Um, I'm trying to come up with exactly the right label, um, but mandated or required or a couple of the ones I'm trying out. Um, the $572,000, and when we say FTE in the brackets there, that's a full-time equivalent, which means a person or position, um, so that would be 11 new ed techs. And this shows you that even though a new investment sounds like sort of a, a wild and crazy thing, um, it's really a very small portion of the proposed budget as a total, that the, the vast majority of our budget is making that level services happen. This also gives you a couple of other figures that the total new investment that is in those bullets that we just looked at is just about 1.2 million. And the net new investment, which means that the actual cost moving forward is 886,000. And that's because we um, repurposed three positions. We have three retiring employees whose positions will not be filled, they'll be reallocated to other um, other jobs that are on the new list. Um, and that, that net new investment is about 1.3% of the proposed budget. And uh, I've been talking with Carolyn about making a, a stack chart. And I, I played with one today. And, and the sad part is that by the time you get done with level services, you can't really see those investments because they're so small. But we'll have to come up with a chart that actually, actually shows that well. I'm not happy with mine yet, but we'll get there. Um, so I thought I should probably quickly share a couple of um, information, a little information about the pre-K program initiative. We didn't really cover that in the budget workshops, um, mostly because it doesn't have a budget impact, um, but it is super exciting. And I know this, this team has talked a lot about it um, in other ways, and um, there's a lot of public information floating around. But our budget actually does include the funding for the new pre-K program. Um, it's been developed as a partnership with Shooting Stars Preschool. And um, the way that the money will be spent in Scarborough's budget is to pay Shooting Stars, basically, to run the program. Um, the full cost of the pilot year is funded by the Department of Education directly. So when you look at the um, the budget summaries you'll see uh, in one of the in one of the charts it shows that separate piece of general purpose aid that goes to pre-K, and then in the line item detail you can also see the pre-K um, accounts that have been set up. So this will prov uh, this will allow us to operate one classroom, 16 students. Um, it's a small step, but a, a mighty step towards um, putting a pre-K program together here in Scarborough that is, uh, is helped by the public schools. And there is a, an, an anticipated mandate coming from the state that says that public schools in Maine will be responsible for children ages three to five. And they're working on that. Um, it's been through many iterations and continues to, to be refined by the legislature. Um, but at this point, you know, we feel like this is a great project for Scarborough. It's a great um, partnership. Shooting Stars is an amazing program, and Ruth Hughes, um, the director there, is an amazing collaborator, and so we're really excited about that. This is a slide I don't get to put in very often. Um, 
State general purpose aid. Um, the school department doesn't really get a lot of non-tax money. Um, we don't have a lot of ways to raise money. We have you know, fees here and, and some reimbursements there. But most of our money that doesn't come from local taxes comes from state general pur purpose aid, which is also called subsidy. And um, this year, unlike in most years where our subsidy either goes down or stays flat or maybe increases a little smidge, it increased by 30%, which is, is quite remarkable. It's still less than 12% uh, of the funding that we need for our total budget, but hey, it's, it's a great increase. And that um, contributed to an overall 20% increase in total non-tax revenue for all of our operating funds, which helps us to ask for less in taxes, even as our, um, as our overall expenses go up. Or our tax ask will be less than the increase in our spending. So this chart shows you the three operating funds of the school department. General fund is K-12, now pre-K-12 um, operating budget. And we have adult education and school nutrition, which operate as separate funds. Uh, the three of those added together become the education budget. And that uh, third line from the bottom shows what we call the gross budget, which is total expenditures. Uh, last year's budget, this year's current proposed, the change in dollars and the change in percentage. The next line down, second from the bottom, is non-tax revenues, which we were just talking about. Um, so revenues that are coming from other sources than the town of Scarborough. And then the bottom line is the amount of money that we will go to the town with and ask them for um, to raise in taxes uh, or in other ways. And, and, it, and the cool thing about this is that our tax request right now is below a 5% increase, and the town council set a goal a few months ago um, for their budget hopes that the tax request, the net budget we call that, um, would come in at less than 5%. So we're pretty pleased to be able to have this number um, up on the screen this early in the process. We won't know what the total town budget looks like until next week when uh, the municipal budget, the town is added to this. Capital budget is also part of that. There's a lot of moving pieces. This is one piece of that puzzle, um, but it's great to be able to have our piece looking good. So we're pleased with that. Um, just for a moment to look at capital projects. So you've got your operating budget and then operating budgets, and then your fourth fund is your capital budget. Um, we use the capital budget for large scale investments, major things that um, are either one time um, or high cost um, investments that take care of your infrastructure, basically. So there usually our, our capital budget is in three chunks, um, technology, transportation, and facilities. And you can see that we have projects in each one of these categories this year. There's a lot of detailed information about the capital budget, um, both in the main part of the budget book, pages 71 to 75, if I remember correctly. And uh, at the very back of the budget book appendix, there's a whole other section on the capital budget with lots of details if you are interested in all the projects that make up the totals there. I do have um, just the totals here. Um, the capital budget is divided into equipment and projects. So equipment is things like vehicles and buses and um, tractors and pickup trucks and um, projects tend to be more of the categories in facilities like um, HVAC and electricity and flooring and roofs and things like that. So this shows you the total amount requested in, in each of those categories and the total capital improvements budget. Funding sources for capital projects, um, in a lot of cases, capital projects are bonded 
they sell municipal bonds, the town sells municipal bonds um, to fund those projects. So it's basically borrowing money, but borrowing it um, through a vehicle that is um, low cost to the town. We can also use reserve funds and we can use tax dollars to pay for capital um, projects. And those funding sources are generally uh, signed by the town finance director, um, but we did have a conversation with um, the town manager and the finance director this week. And it looks like the bulk of what the school department has on their list um, is eligible for bonding. So we'll hear more about that next week as well when we see the town's uh, full budget, the town's capital budget as well. Um, so this is just a chart that lays out the four different funds, general fund, operating, adult ed, school nutrition, and capital improvements. So you can see them all in one place. Um, Carolyn has the pleasure of reading all these numbers out when you're uh, taking a motion to vote on. So um, that'll be lots of fun. And this just puts it all into one, one screen for you. Um, the same info is on the handouts that are sitting right here. If anybody really needs to take those numbers home, I have a copy of the budget motions that has those numbers. And all of this stuff, of course, will be available um, in the uh, online and the public display there. So I think the next slide is dates. Oh, I did one of those fancy things again, huh? I'm just, uh, you know, the transitions are so important. <laughs> just slowly. Well, you can't go in all of the meetings at once. You have to take them one at a time, right? It is. It's crazy exciting. So next week, um, Monday, we've got our finance committee budget review. I'm looking forward to that. We have a lot of great questions that have already been asked a lot of requests for different ways to look at data. Um, so I think that team can really dig in, sort of figure out some ways to present material to the public that'll be helpful. The town school budget presentation, as I mentioned, is Wednesday night. Um, that The town council has a special meeting. Um, so we'll get to see the big picture then, um, which will be great. And then we roll through all of the different pieces of the budget process. Um, and really, I would just encourage folks to stay tuned to these things. These are all public meetings. They're all opportunities for folks to weigh in, to learn more. Um, you know, in most cases, if they're not live streamed, they're recorded and posted. So um, lots of ways to, to stay connected and, and find out. And I may have said the words that are on the next slide, which are stay connected. These are all the things that our community can do to be involved in the budget process. Um, I have the school department budget page linked in again. And I also have the town of Scarborough budget portal linked in there because they have their own budget page, which is linked to our page. So you really can't get lost. You just got to get in there. Um, but that will show you the entire municipal budget and all of the um, documents that they decide to post up there. Um, to give you the full picture of what's going on in town. I think that's it for me. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Kate? I wore you right out, I know. Well, don't go too far. No, I let no. everyone else go first, but I still have one. <laughs> Is that it? Does anybody, do you have some? I have a topic. Okay. Are you sure? You don't want to? Yeah, take your go ahead. I, uh, Kate, can you remind me the um, the increase in the GPA? Is that separate from the funding that we get for the special needs programs? The reimbursement that we get from the state? But you saw that you mentioned was it a thirty percent increase in the GPA? So the GPA incorporates okay. the changes. Um, in spending in special education in the in the general budget, so you're not you're not thinking about the federal stuff, right? This, right. okay, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, so, yep. so yes, when we talk about subsidy, there there were elements that we talked about that influenced the reason why that subsidy amount increased, and one of them was special education, 
and then there were other factors that gave us a boost mm -hmm. in the EPS formula, which is how the state determines it. But it, it comes to us um, not earmarked for anything specifically. Okay. What they do is they incorporate all those costs into a big number that says, this is what we think it costs to run schools in Scarborough. And then they say, you may have this portion of it. Okay. Um, so those are, those elements drive the formula, oh, sure. but they aren't, when you get the money, it isn't designated for those reasons. All right. That, was it. that makes you. sense. Perfect. Can you tell me um, the, um, don't go back, I'll just tell you, the $366,000 for personnel turnover and reallocation of positions. How many positions did you say that reallocated? Three. Three. So three that, um, weren't um, it weren't necessarily needed this year that we could reallocate without bringing on new staff. Right. So what what we have is three. Um, we have a number of people who are retiring, but we have um, three positions that will be vacant due to retirement that we propose not to refill. Um, two of them are classroom positions at the middle school where the enrollment permitted them to shift um, their class, their teacher structure, teacher teaming structure, and serve the number of kids that they know they will have next year um, with fewer teaching staff. Um, and one was a teacher at uh, Eight Corners School, and they're going to repurpose that position into one of the kindergarten intervention teachers that you heard about. Um, so making an attempt to right size for the, um, uh, class size targets that we have, the teacher student ratios that we have, um, but also to say, okay, so we can reuse those positions in another way and not just add a new position on top of them. There's also included in that number, um, I don't like to use the word breakage exactly, but turnover calculations, turnover savings calculations, where um, if we know that a person is retiring and that they're at the very top of the salary scale, which most of our retirees are, because they've worked to the end of their career, um, we can guess that we will save a little bit of money when we hire someone to replace them because that person will be further down on the, on the scale. Um, there's a little bit of finesse to it because the younger folks tend to take more expensive benefits. So you can't just say, you know, oh, it's a zillion dollars between the newbie and, and the retiree. Um, but we figured out um, over the course of several years what's an average amount of change that we can expect between a retiree and a new hire. And um, we apply that up front. We assume that up front. So that's a piece of that $366 as well thousand dollars as well perfect thank you yeah yes and so just for my sake are those three ones taking the place of the three that are retiring or whatever are they on the new list or are they baked into the the total of the new they're on the new list they're on the new list that's right. what i thought okay so first you take the reduction and then you do the add so so basically what we're saying is that three of the new positions that we're proposing are paid for by replacing right. an old position. Right. So we're not, so three of those new positions are not a tax, tax ask. That right. is a hard thing to get out. They're not, they're not increasing our budget. They're, um, I guess you could say that, that they're level services, but they're not because they're new, right? right. So, so we do call them out as new things. But we say, you know, we're in creating this new thing, we're going to take away this older thing that was level services that we don't need. All right, and then the 11 additional special ed tech three positions. So I, I know this is an area we struggle to, to hire in. Um, if we cannot get those 11 positions because they are mandated by law, what, what, it, what do we do? What happens? Well, so Chris spoke to this a little bit, um, and he's much more articulate than I am on this subject, but um, so if anybody really wants to dig in, they could look at the, at the recordings, um, but uh, we do shift staff around um, 
all the time. We have ed techs that are you know, potentially working with more than one child or a child that doesn't have a one-to-one -one requirement that you can sort of juggle coverage. Um, in terms of hiring, we have tried all kinds of creative things, um, combining two ed tech positions and making a professional position, um, hiring BCBAs, um, which I can't say exactly what that is, but it's behavioral something. Yeah, I'm acronym. Ac acronym trouble. <laughs> Board certified behavior analyst. There you are. It's there a team are. effort. It yes. is. It <laughs> takes a village. <laughs> uh, so what what may happen is that you may have to hire somebody who is not an ed tech because that way you can offer a higher salary um, and. You can still provide those services. And the other way that we've managed to cover open positions this year is to use contracted services. Um, and uh, through contracted services, we currently have three more or less ed tech positions. Um, and then a fourth that's actually a person who's, um, well, let's just call it four, four positions that are being, that are um, employed by other agencies that are working within our district. Thank you. But it is challenging, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so I guess I could put in a plug for the contract negotiations that are going to be going on for our support staff. And um, one of the reasons it's super important to have competitive wages um, through our collective bargaining process is so that we can attract and retain good workers for these critical positions. Can I follow up on your plug with a question? But does your budget obviously takes into account the negotiations that are going on and, and has budgeted to, to in order to appropriately remunerate people? after the results of negotiations. Yeah, and that can be a little bit of a delicate thing because you can't necessarily say publicly what exactly you've budgeted because negotiations are, are supposed to be confidential until they aren't, um, until things are agreed upon. But um, from a budget perspective, when you have an open bargaining unit and you don't know exactly what people are going to be making in the coming year, um, we rely on a number of things. We rely on, you know, the sort of industry standards of, of where, um, what uh, level of percent increase or COLA folks are getting in the wider world. Um, we rely on comps or comparative wages from other districts um, that surround us so that we get that labor market piece. Um, and the same information that's going into the uh, deliberations of the board negotiations committee are also shared with the business office so that we have some sense of where the board is and you know how the negotiations are going. And that can be an item in motion too. Um, so at first reading, we may be um, having some wild guesses um, and closer to second reading, we may be able to nail that down a little bit closer. Um, yeah, I've just, I've, I've yeah. asked several times um, by different folks that like, that we've we've accounted for that in our budget. Yes, we are aware of that. That's part of the budgeting. Process. We are we are so aware of it, more. and yeah. and there is a methodology for ensuring that you have sufficient funds to bargain with. Yes. Unfortunately, it happens every three years, <laughs> so we're we're pretty good at that. And do you know what the other districts are like? How we compare right now with the other districts? I I think I understand that other districts have negotiated these contracts more recently than we have? Some districts uh, reopened contracts after COVID. Um, some, some districts um, are, you know, in different cycles than we are right. because, you know, not everybody lines up and has their bargaining agreements go the same three years or two years or whatever it is. Um, we have a pretty good sense um, of where folks are and, um, I would say that for the ed techs particularly, that we're, we're behind, we're below where we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, but that's often the case in the negotiations here, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're trying to, you've made your best guess 
when you were developing a three-year contract mm -hmm. of where the world was going to be. And then when you get to the end of the three years, you go, oh, where is the world now? Let's, let's find out. Does that answer your question? I'm trying to be a little vague. <laughs> I, can give you, I can give you a chart quietly in the corner. Okay. Um, and my last question is, can you just tell us um, the, the paid family medical leave for the new, the new state program, um, what exactly is that money going what the heck is that? Yeah, like what, what are we doing with this? Um, oh, gosh. Let's see how articulate I can be I about this. Um, Don't worry, so, we have all night. <laughs> I think your colleagues might disagree with you. Um, so, so what happened was the, the state of Maine, the Maine State Legislature, decided that it would be a cool thing to have a state-based um, medical leave program, which could serve any employee citizen of the state of Maine. Um, it's not uncommon for that to exist. There are lots of other states that have state, um, you might have heard of it as state disability or state, you know, short-term disability. Or um, It's got a lot of labels. Um, but the idea is that the state would run a program that would provide paid medical leave to any employee in the state of Maine um, based on what they earn from their employer and you know a, a bunch of other parameters. And it, it's to do with medical leave, right? So it's um, an injury or illness to yourself or a family member. Um, the family member thing is a little broad in the statute. It can be your, as far as I can tell, it can be your next door neighbor or somebody you like a lot. Um, there's, it's a little loose. <laughs> Uh, but it, I think for me, it helps to think of it in terms of it's sort of like unemployment. Um, and that's why they've given it to Department of Labor, I think, because I think they intend Department of Labor to manage it similarly to the way that they man manage un unemployment in the state of Maine, which is, you know, they collect money from employers and they put it into a big pool and then they distribute it according to the need of individual employees. Um, there hasn't been a lot of talk yet about how a person applies for this. Um, the first step is to start collecting money to build the pool. So the, the money is supposed to start flowing to the state of Maine in January of 25, which is why we have mm -hmm. a piece of it in our 2025 FY25 budget. And the statute says that uh, the employer may charge half of the cost, up to half of the cost to the employee. The cost is a total of 1% of gross payroll. So if we have a payroll on Friday and we pay out a million dollars, it's 1% of that that needs to go to the state of any dollar earned by any employee. Um, so there's been a lot of um, back and forth with the, the business managers and the lawyers and the people who care about these things, MSMA, um, about, well, how are we going to manage this? What are we going to do? What should we budget for? Considering that it, it, it's still in flux, the rules haven't been made yet. Um, they could change, the legislature could change the plan. Um, but the, the latest guidance is that we should really plan to be able to provide as employers half of 1% of all of our payroll starting January 1st. Um, interesting thing for schools is that um, our year doesn't divide evenly with January. Right, because we have staff who come in September, and so it's much more than half of their year. It's half the fiscal year, but we can't really think of it in terms of you know just take cut it in half because we have um, staff who their whole earnings are starting in September and then ending in June. So there's a little fancy math there. Um, but what we're hoping is we've, we've put 
more than we needed to, a little bit more than we needed to in this first reading budget because the, we were told, well, you should have the whole 1% ready to go. And um, now they're refining that a little bit more. So I'll be interested to see what kind of guidance we get. There's a, um, a training sort of thing coming up for the business manager specifically from Department of Labor in April that I'll be doing. And um, there's some stuff at uh, the HR convention in May that we'll be going to. So it's, it's a big question. I mean, it affects everybody. It'll be the town of Scarborough too. It'll be any employer in the state of Maine. Hannaford's having these same conversations. Yeah. Everybody's in the party. So that's a lot of rambling. Does that get anywhere towards yeah. what you're thinking, what you're wondering? Thank you. Here, are there any other questions for Kate? All right, thank you, Kate. Um, agenda item 9.1.1 is the first reading of the FY25 school budget. So for this, I'll turn it over to Carolyn for her. Reading skills. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if my voice will give out on me. All right, so I move the approval, move approval to adopt the Leadership Council's budget proposal as presented for first reading. Total general fund operating budget is proposed at $66,562,878 with offsetting non-tax revenues of $9,770,696 and a tax request to the town of $56,792,182. Total adult education budget is proposed at $214,358, with offsetting non-tax revenues of $140,569, and a tax request to the town of $73,789. Total, total school nutrition budget is proposed at $2,404,192, with offsetting non-tax revenues of $2,404,192, and no tax request to the town. Capital equipment proposed budget is $1,940,874, and capital projects proposed budget is $4,000,000. $493,475 for a total capital improvement budget of $6,434,349. Wonderful. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Um, Leanne couldn't be with us tonight, but I do have her thoughts um, that she asked for me to share. Um, first, she says, I would like to thank the staff for the overview provided this week and their willingness to answer our probing questions as we prepare for advocacy of the budget with the community. I am in support of the budget as presented by the staff and would ask our finance team to please consider adding additional or protecting specific resources to support our students. Number one, add the 1.0 FTE for the speech pathologist for our youngest learners. The intervention this position can provide will have long-lasting influence as the students move through the district. Number two, protect the request for the K-2 shared librarian. The additional time to the students, I'm sorry, the additional time the students will have in the library will assist with improving their reading skills while also developing a long-term appreciation of books. Number three, protect the WIN resource for Wentworth. The role as described is critical to the success of our programming in addressing losses due to chronic absenteeism. Number four, add an additional snack opportunity to our nutrition program to offset the impact of the split lunches, either ensuring those students at first lunch have an afternoon snack or those with late lunches will have a mid-morning snack. Not all students ha may have the resources to bring a snack from home and asking a child who may be hungry to save half of their breakfast does not lend itself to their best learning. As a board, we should be highlighting the great work of our nutrition services and the backpack program in resolving food insecurity within our community. The value they are providing cannot be underscored enough and our advocacy of their budget request is paramount to maintain this programming. I understand the impact of the increase Increases on taxes this year is predicated to be steep, is predicted, excuse me, to be steep. However, before we assume the worst, we need to balance the negative impacts these cuts will have on our students and realizing that kicking the can of interventions or support will only cost more in the future. So that is Leanne's asks. Um, 
I'm also going to ask for a, a, re, a look, a second look at the speech pathologist um, position. And this, this comes after a lot of great reflection and a lot of thought about um, what Chris shared with us and um, how he thinks he could meet these needs even if this position remains unmet. And I'm certainly not the expert, Chris is the expert, but I'm also looking at numbers that tell us that this there's 48 hours a week right off the top. That's more than a full-time position in our district. We're looking at really essentially one and a half people almost. And so um, even if that number comes down, as Chris indicated in our workshop, um, I don't see it coming down enough to warrant leaving it unmet. Yeah. Um, I would also support adding that position into the budget. And um, my reasoning is a little different. I think um, there's a good probability that given the current legislation that if CVS services get moved to the school districts, and K through three, then we need to start building infrastructure to support those students. That infrastructure is gonna lean heavily on OT and PT, as those are some of the earliest interventions that are frequently used by children who, are, who require CDS services. And so having people on staff who have that specialty and we're building a robust program so we can meet our needs, but also look to the future so that we can pivot quickly if we need to, um, because if they're talking about a three-year rollout um, CBS does not have the infrastructure to meet the children's needs right now in our community. Um, that's a pretty much a statewide problem and we may be more fortunate than some communities, um, but we still would have to do a lot of work and I think this would put us in a better position to meet the needs of our children right now um, with, without having gaps, but also would position us um, that if that bill passes, which um, I think is not unlikely, that we would be able to meet it would give us a head start on important services that we're going to need to provide. So I just think it's it's good preparing for the future, and it also really will help us meet the children's needs right now. I know we're already sometimes struggling to, to staff every service in a week, and I know special services does an amazing job to do everything they can to meet those needs. But I don't. I think that if we can help them meet the needs of required services that children in our district need, we should do that. Um, I just, I, I want to say one more thing. I didn't quite finish my thoughts. Um, I understand this. The, I don't typically ask for more than, than what leadership. I put a lot of stock in what the leadership committee group tells me, and I put a lot of faith in what they tell me, and this year is no different. Um, I, I still have the same level of faith. <laughs> my concern is that that is a huge workload, and I, I understand what we're looking at as a town. I know the obstacles we're against, um, and I wouldn't be asking this if I didn't feel it was absolutely necessary. And I feel like this is an absolutely necessary position. Can I piggyback on you again? Yes. Um, I'm, part, I'm on a committee um, that is uh, a spinoff of the negotiations committee. This is not confidential. I would not be talking about it. But it has to do specifically with looking at certain aspects of people's um, job functions and the one that I'm on happens to be special services. It doesn't focus on speech or OT specifically, but it does focus on individuals who are adjacent to those positions. And one of the things that we're discussing is higher rates of burnout um, and the difficulty to manage those positions. And so I think we need to be very mindful about making sure we have adequately resourced the, the people we're asking to work with our most vulnerable populations um, and ensuring they have every resource they need so that we're able to retain staff. Because if we overtax an OT, trying to get an OT in the middle of the year is almost impossible. These are very specialized positions. There's not enough to go around. We need to make sure we take care of our people so that they can take care of our children. All right, so we have a first and a second. Um, we call the vote. Um, all, we're all here. So all in favor of approving the first reading of the FY25 school budget? Right. That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Agenda item 9.2 is the selection of volunteers for the superintendent interview committee. Let me... <laughs> You know what? 
did we leave, lose the online? Is that? <laughs> Wind has been whipping a little bit. Oh my God. God. I, it's like, like a tunnel come. there. I keep <laughs> thinking, like, is something going to come through this window? <laughs> yeah. A tree? A it cow? Sounds like it. <laughs> that would be a hell of a window. Yeah, a five minute before. Yeah, it's out of one of Yes. Okay. We will take a five minute recess and come back yeah. at 840. Oh.
All right, welcome back. Sorry for that. We were having technical difficulties. And so where we left off was the selection of volunteers for the superintendent search interview committee, excuse me. So um, just to give a little bit of background before I start the selection, we put out a request for volunteers. Um, we received over 40 applications back. Um, uh, we asked for specific um, categories, if you will, of, of people, of, of residents, so that we made sure that we we covered um, a wide variety of, of the stakeholders, um, people that would, would you know, want to say in this process. So those categories were middle school students, high school students, a community member without a student currently living in the home, a parent of a K-2 student, a parent of a 3-5 student, a middle school parent, a high school parent, um, district leader and admins, administrators, administrators, a K through two teacher, a three through five teacher, a middle school teacher, and a high school teacher. And these representatives will be joined by um, three board members at the, in the town manager. So we will start with our middle school students. Um, I have a randomizer in here that Jillian was so gracious to create for me. Um, and I will flip it right now. It's very fancy. That's cool. Yes. All right. <laughs> Our middle school student that is going to participate is Dylan Jewett. He will be on the committee. Our high school student. I'll push this out so everybody can be a... Our high school student will be Kaylin Addington. Um, we did not get any community members without students currently in the home, so um, no representatives there. Mariella Fortier was the K-2. Um, we had one application in that category, so that will be Mariella Fortier. Um, our three to five parent, we had two. And that will be Jeff Oliver. Our middle school parent, we had one um, applicant. That will be Kristen Turner. Our high school parent, um, we did not have any high school parents that um, applied. So that is a vacant. Our district leader and admin will be Chris Rohde. Our K-2 teacher, we did have one, um, one applicant. That will be Kelsey O'Neill. Our three through five teachers, we have three. Megan Bla Blakemore. Our middle school teachers, we had two. That will be Jeff Lowe. And our high school teachers, we had two. And that will be Sarah Kappelman. So um, one last time, let me read this off and then um, talk to you about one more thing. Um, so we will have Dylan Jewett, Kaylin Addent Addington, Mariella Fortier, Jeff Oliver, Kristen Turner, Chris Rohde, Kelsey O'Neill, Megan Black Blakemore, Jeff Lowe, and Sarah Kappelman will serve on the superintendent interview committee. Um, at the same time, we did get a, um, a letter from the SEA. Um, so I want to introduce that request. And their, the request was regarding their participation in the committee. So I'll just read the email. The Scarborough Education Association Representative Assembly respectfully requests that a member of the RA is included on the hiring and or interview committee when the district is vetting, interviewing, and hiring leadership positions, particularly positions such as the superintendent and director positions. The SEA is the sole bargaining unit for Scar Scarborough schools, and our membership includes staff across all phase levels and all departments, including but not limited to teachers, educational technicians, secretarial staff, bus drivers, food service, and custodial staff. We represent all staff, not just our members, when we enter negotiations and advocate for working conditions. 
We work directly with the superintendent and other leaders in the district to problem solve issues as, a, as equals under labor law, Winter Garden. As such, we represent one of the biggest stakeholders with the Scarborough Schools community. While most employees of Scarborough Schools are members of the SEA, SEA officers and building representatives through our work with membership with the through our work with membership with the representative assembly and with the contract can look at member concerns with a wider lens and a rank and file member. Because of our role in size, we believe that the association needs and deserves a seat at the table in decisions involving hiring leadership leadership positions in the district. We look forward to your response and the association's inclusion in deciding future leadership positions. So first, are there any questions about um, who is sitting at the table, about the letter? Okay. So do I have a motion to approve the selection of volunteers for the superintendent interview committee? So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> With the... the was two vacancies there were two places that people didn't apply two yes i don't know i mean those are community member spots uh yes one was a community member without a student in the house and one was a high school parent oh okay thank you mm -hmm. um i do have oh sorry do you, go ahead no you go ahead while i'm Look, and I have a message from Leanne again. Go ahead. Um, I think I like. I think I would support adding a, a space for an SEA member on the committee, other designee. I think that um, while the board and the SEA um, comes to the table and negotiates um, a lot. And that can be a fraught situation. I think taking a step back and looking at what the SEA represents um, as a representative on behalf of teachers and staff throughout the district, I think that merits consideration. I think it was a valid request. Um, and I think that they should be at the table. Thank you, Brayla. I have a question. Mm -hmm. is, that, um, is it duplicative in any way if, you're, if you have teachers or staff on the committee already and to have the SEA, is that duplicating efforts? I'm not saying no, I'm just mm -hmm. asking the question. Um, well, I think that the SEA are also teachers, the, rep the leadership team, they're also teachers and staff members, so potentially, yeah. I think that's a valid question or concern. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a note from Leanne. Um, she says that she is not in favor of elevating one group of staff over another. Um, she, I, she says, I really respect the work that the SEA does and appreciates the working relationship. Um, she feels like it would be inappropriate for us to give the SEA member a direct voice on the committee, um, given we are not doing so for our district leadership, meaning we are not having everyone sit at the table. That's her feeling. Um, my feeling is um, when I when I kind of like Freyla, if I step back and look at this a little bit differently, um, the reason we invited the town manager to sit on this committee is because we really value the relationship that he and, Ta and Jeff have built um, over the last two years. And I think that it's really helped us as we've moved the building steering committee project forward and um, to refer referendum and ultimately still to this day, he's a, a very active member of that committee. And um, that working relationship is really, really important. And so if I step back and look at the SEA, I feel like their relationship working, or their working relationship with the superintendent is just as important in a different way. Um, and so for that reason, I am, I am comfortable adding a seat at the table. All right, so. Oh. I also just want to put a plug in because we did add teacher positions, but the SEA goes beyond teachers, and there's a large number of member of our, st our school staff that aren't directly classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. I think when we think of schools, teachers are the, come to the forefront of your mind of, like, who makes up a school. But I think the SEA really plays an active role when we think about our bus drivers, when we think about our school nurses, when we talk about our administrative staff, our support staff. There's so many other people that... I mean, we, we gloss over, I think, every day when we talk about schools. And, te again, teachers are that front-facing. That's who, you're, who you talk to about your kid. Um, and I think that that is a valuable as well. I think that bus drivers whose daily schedules sometimes 
are dependent on the superintendent's decisions have have a place at that table and I really want to make sure we get a broad group um, I don't think we lose anything by adding shares I think we just get more diversity of opinion hopefully you know if it's duplicitous then they might have the same opinion but if we are able to pull in voices that we don't always hear from I would really be interested in that like I I think that is important um, when we when we when we think about districts and to go beyond teachers teachers are very important I'm not taking away anything from the, the teaching staff obviously they're a critical role but they are not the only ones who are in their role and I think they would be the first ones to say that yeah, and I'm just looking I would agree with that with um, to support a seat at the table for the SEA just because Freyla is right I think they are very um, all-encompassing of everybody within the, the district so it's not just teaching staff and I think that would be beneficial in this process so um, what did you say, John? I'm sorry. They're not all encompassing, though, because they don't. There's a group of people that don't represent mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. Or just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not all. I mean, you know, I'm just. Yeah. I don't know how to. I don't even know how to think about it. Yeah. And so. <laughs> so the way we. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just am curious how that would work. Like, would they self-appoint, or would they? Will we give them a little application period for somebody from the SEA to? Well, their work, the interview committee's work, starts, I think, next week. Um, yeah, it's next. It's Tuesday. It's five days. Their work starts. So I don't think we have time to open an application. I think we could either, first off, if we're going to change this, um, I, I, we, we would need to entertain an amendment because we had already set, we had already created the, the format for what we wanted to do. So that's number one. So if somebody wanted to offer an amendment, um, you, you, could, you could specify, you, however you want it to read. If you want to specify a certain representative, their representatives run the gamut from... Um, Teachers to secretaries to um, to but there's a bus driver. Um, Yeah, they have, what is it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 people on their representative committee. I know at least one of them is a bus bus driver, a representative. I don't know where. There's a support staff member there. There, So there are some other, some other options. So if, um, is anybody interested in offering an amendment to the... So interview committee, as we've named it. What is the, you would, yeah, go ahead. Um, I offer an amendment to, what's the title of it? To the superintendent, superintendent interview, search, committee. interview committee makeup that we previously uh, adopted to add a member of the SEA. And I, I the, the full SEA, not just a representative? A representative, no, okay. what they their, requested, the, their membership. I know, I would, I was, the SEA can seat a member. I don't care. They, it's there. At their seat, they can seat the member. So, make you make that, clean that up a little bit. So, I would offer a motion to allow the SEA to put a member of their choosing on the committee. They would have to designate a name before the start of the committee. It would be one, one person. Okay, do we have a second? No second. Oh. Okay, so no second, so that fails. So we're back to the original, which is the, do I, we had a motion 
to approve the volunteers for the superintendent interview committee. So as it stands would be without SEA representation. Yeah, yes. Exact words, but. <laughs> say my, my way may fail too. Um, let me see. I move to add a seat at the superintendent interview interview committee uh, from the SEA that is uh, non-teacher specific or related. Non-teacher specific related or, position. Yeah. Yeah, I, I doubled my words there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right, so can I have that back, please? Thank you. <laughs> all right, so all in favor of um, the amendment, which is to add a non-teacher SEA position to the inter superintendent interview committee. All against? All right, so that is um, six to one passes. Six to one passes, thank you. Um, okay, so back to the original as amended. So do I... Um, all in favor of approving the superintendent interview committee as amended? All opposed? All right, thank you. That passes six to one. All right. Um, I will reach out tomorrow to the SEA and let them know about our vote. All right. Um, agenda item 9.3 is the first reading of policy JLAA, the wellness policy. So for this, I'll turn it over to Freyla. This policy should be very familiar as we adopted it approximately two months ago. Um, when after adoption of the policy, we came to understand that we had made, um, there was a discrepancy in the policy as written in the policy that we adopted. It is a single line in that policy. Um, the one we adopted, if you look at that uh, original of the one that's in effect right now, under subsection one, which is nutrition standards, 1.2F states that we will not provide beverages that are enhanced with caffeine for sale to any student. We have a cafe at the high school only that provides coffee to students. Um, the reason that we do that is because otherwise students go off grounds and they buy coffee, which is often higher levels with higher levels of caffeine in it. And I think there have been some notable news articles lately about beverages that are available that can be have dangerous levels of caffeine in it. Also, it drives students off campus if they're gonna go purchase beverages elsewhere. Um, so there's been a program, um, and we have, I think, I think we had it described at the budget meeting, of a student that actually bakes for that program um, and provides a coffee shop um, at the high school. There are no beverages with caffeine available to students who are not at the high school, so not at the younger grades. And I specifically asked a question about soda. I know soda hasn't been available for purchase in schools for years, but I wanted to confirm because that's one of the beverages where students, youngsters particularly, have access to caffeine. That it, we, soda is not on the menu. It's never going to be on the menu. This is just a coffee shop cart at the high school. Um, in order to allow that program to continue, we need to amend this policy to delete that line. So the amendment deletes 1.2F and takes 1.2G and makes it the new 1.2F that has to do with nutritional content of foods. Um, it's a very small change, but um, through our audit process, uh, it was discovered that there was this discrepancy. And so unless we want to end the coffee cart program at the high school, we need to end our policy to allow that beverage, that coffee beverages to be sold at the schools. Again, only at the high school, only coffee. Any questions? Yeah. Do we specify in any way the, the caffeine content percentage? We no. don't. It was okay. a blanket prohibition before, and we... And, and sort of, we just deleted it. We just took it out. I also would say that I think our nutrition program, is, that's that sort of information, like they evaluate the nutritional, I mean, we had a lot of information, actually the budget, about how they evaluate the program. And so um, I don't believe we're going to be seeing dangerously high levels of caffeine <laughs> offered to sales students in their eliminator for just anytime soon. All right, do I have a motion to approve the first reading of policy JLAA wellness? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, all in favor? 
Um, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, agenda item 9.4 is the June school board meeting dates. Um, I just realized um, I right before I came in here, I was updated on the town council meeting yesterday and the fact that the town council voted on the governance, updating the governance document for the building steering committee. Um, I wasn't aware that that was on this agenda and so I didn't include it on ours and I failed to ask for an adjustment. So um, I, I'm a little at a loss. I guess we'll have to wait till the next meeting as our adjustment period has, has passed by. Um, so just to kind of update on what's happening, um, the uh, Councilor McGee spoke with me about the building steering committee and essentially the um, place they're at right now is that they believe that they need to extend the time already. They are, um, I think it's fair to say, struggled to get, off, get their feet underneath them and they did not believe that a May 1st due date for their report was doable at this point. And so they were asking um, for an extension up to June 12th. So if you look at your, if you look at the calendar for June, um, June 19th is um, a holiday, Juneteenth. And so the town council meeting has um, been moved to June 26th. So the June 12th date allows a two week period for the town council, the school board and the community to read the report, digest it, come up with questions and then have a um, joint workshop on a school board town council joint workshop on the 26th to discuss the report, the committee's recommendations. At that point on the 26th, the town council will vote to um, approve or disapprove those recommendations right afterwards at their regularly scheduled meeting. And so what the ask of for us is that we change, we move our meeting from June 20th to June 27th so that we can vote the next day after the town council has voted. So I know that's a lot of dates. So what we are talking about tonight is moving the June 20th date to June 27th. What I will bring next week, next meeting um, is a request to update the governance document. Yeah, that's a that's a heads up because I just just got that word as I was right before I walked in. So um, do I, um, it, it, this isn't anything we need to vote on. This isn't an action item. Just want to see, check the temperatures here, see how we feel about that. Are you talking about the, the movement the of movement the, of the, the yeah, date we, to we 20th talk, or 27th? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's a week. It's fine. I think I planned something now. Well, here's our, yeah, and here, definitely check our calendar, and here's the other piece of it, is that Jeff, um, his last day, given his resignation letter, was the 30th, the 30th of Sunday, so really his last day is the 28th, so that's pushing right up to when he he's leaving. Um, the other thing is that, um, the, the one piece of good news, I think, is that um, we potentially could have our new superintendent here to hear the recommendations. So with Jeff, like in addition to Jeff, but that's one piece. Hmm? I'm sorry. I said, I said I'll be away, but I will, I will zoom in, I guess. But um, I, Hmm. That does make a weird sticky timeline, so it's, I'm not sure how to feel. Um, the uh, uh, it feels weird because it's not we're not talking about it in concert with the governance document, right? Like one kind of fits with the other. So um, I, I I don't know, Jillian. What are your thoughts on where the building committee is and how they are working? I mean, I think people are feeling extremely um, time crunched. Although you know, we we do keep saying, you know, 
if we need to extend, it's not, let's not worry about that. Let's just, let's just try to move through the work. Mm -hmm. um, that is a big hang up for people. Um, so on one hand, moving, you know, moving things out makes mm -hmm. sense, but I just don't know that we've hit that like absolutely necessary point yet. Um, <laughs> that's a real struggle. I, I don't, I don't know. But the the council, I believe, is asking for it. Is that what so I? So the council, what I was told as I was walking in, is the council actually voted yesterday. Oh, and they voted to extend the deadline. I missed it. Oh well, I guess. I I me as well. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I just so they voted to extend the deadline of the report and the governance document. So they've updated. They voted to update the governance document to extend the report's due date to June 12th. Okay, well, then, I mean, it feels like it leaves us little choice. Um, I'm not sure how that's supposed to work when this is a joint committee and we're not, but here we are, yeah, so. The town did it last night. Oh, I see what you're saying. Get one so the question them, is, Diane. can we go before? Um, <laughs> so the joint workshop wouldn't be until the 26th because all along we said we would give two weeks from the report date to our to our oh. joint workshop. Oh, okay. Well, so we don't get a say. Mm -hmm. oh, did you look it up? This is the well, joint, performative vote. This joint <laughs> committee, we get no say. Sorry. Um, in this joint committee, we get no say in what's going to happen because they voted last night and up. left us out of it. Again. Um, I mean, you could vote it. We could certainly take a vote, and it could be voted down, and then they might, I guess, at that point, Jillian and Leanne would have to go back to Nick in April and figure out a new plan. Yep. But shouldn't they have done that before? <clears throat> figure a plan out first and then I think well, I guess it's and then my hold a vote I, 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 mean, I there's, been, I there's been a lot of Jillian pressure there has been a lot of pressure to move this out and so and I think that you know it, it was especially heavy on council so I mean I we knew that they were thinking about doing it I just wasn't I was surprised that it happened last night that's all but so <laughs> I I didn't so it feels like what's, it sounds like you should be surprised Grow, we all should be surprised because it's, I mean, uh, it, it sounds like we're supposed to be working together, but we're not. I think that's the thing. There, we, we have so, two separate meetings. So, yeah. Um, I should say that I did not attend last night's town council meeting, nor have I watched it yet. So I, I don't know yeah, from firsthand I'm, experience that th this vote happened. I'm taking into the word of a counselor. Okay. Which I presume so, to be true. Yeah, yeah right. Gonna, but well, I, I should be very clear that I was not in attendance. I'm behind so, um, meeting too. I knew that the, I, I guess for me, I'm looking at Jillian. I, I, I knew I attend the meetings as the just so I'm um, as the third me ish member of from the board, and so that as the chair, um, I've been attending, and I know there is some concern around the May first. There has been some concern around the May first date. Yeah. The other thing I'm aware of that I just my observations is that committee has a lot of people that are newer to the process, um, newer to the school building process. And so um, there has been some time taken at the last three meetings to really orient them to the project and to the school and to the district and to the needs. So that has taken some time, right? But they've been, I, in my opinion, very, very valuable meetings and very, very valuable opportunities to kind of ground the committee in the facts of what our district is facing. So yes, they took half of, th well, maybe more than half of the meeting for three consecutive meetings, but I think it's time well spent. And so from that perspective, I'm not, I'm not upset that we have to push out a month because essentially we're talking about the time they took to get oriented. Um, I just. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we don't push this out now, it, you know, we, we have only a couple weeks to do that. So, I mean, it, it yeah, they're, they haven't started yet creating a report, and I do think the timeline is, is very short. 
it's it's a lot of pressure. And from my from my perspective, it, it's the committee asking us to push it out. It's so they they say they need more time. So mm -hmm. I I feel like I need to be respectful of that. It's a it's a daunting task. Um, so I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah, it's disappointing how some maybe the communication part is 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 disappointing, but at the end of the day, if that's what they're asking, I think that's what we should provide them. Is there new information that's come out, or is there going through new all sorts of new different steps that weren't there before? So a timeline was proposed at, gosh, the, not last meeting, the the meeting before, um, and it was a it was a. Uh, very um, stacked, <laughs> it was very packed uh, with work. I, and I think people immediately just were like, we can't, we can't get this. Um, that's a lot to accomplish in that time. And we haven't even, like, so, so our next meeting, we will be forming subcommittees. That, so they're just going to go out and do their work. So it is true, it's gonna be, what, almost April? to turn it around in a month. I mean, we don't want anything hasty decisions either, but that is what I think really prompted all of that. And it's, I mean, week after week, it's, you know, weeks go by so quick. And I do think, um, just to piggyback on what Jillian's saying, the other piece of information that um, I have heard at the meetings is that um, there is concern that the survey material results haven't been returned yet. And so by the time they get them, they might have a month or less to write up their recommendation after the re results come in of the community survey. So that is the other piece of information that um, I have heard some feedback on. Yeah. And that's true too. I mean, we have a few weeks, those are going out this week and then they have to come back and be analyzed so, and that is supposed to be one of the tools to inform the committee and here, again, May 1st deadline with, we're creeping up on April real quick. Right. So, yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I just, I'm sorry, I was confused about, and we also did miss this past meeting, so I think there's been a little bit of a gap yeah. because we were in budget, budget. talks, so. All right, so does that feel okay with everyone? Okay. So I will get back with with Nick and let him know that we are gonna change our meeting date. So the 26th is when we'll do our joint workshop with town council and the 27th is when we'll do our board meeting vote. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna make a motion to amend the governance document to update the dates, um, which ca you can adopt as a rule explanation. You c if um, once the motion's considered, a motion to adopt, uh, to change an adopted agenda can be made by two thirds of a vote in the middle of a meeting, just so people are know. So I'm making that motion to uh, change the agenda to open discussion on the governance document and to add that to the agenda. Do I have a second? So moved. Or second, whatever. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay. All in favor of amending the agenda to include discussion and adoption of the governance document? Uh, we are unanimous. Thank you. Okay. So a new um, 9.5 would be the um, Building Steering Committee governance document. Um, which if you just wanted to take a look at it, if you go to our website on the building project page, there's a link um, right under the purpose and the charge. And if you look all the way down to the committee charge number two, it says that the committee will provide a final recommendation report on a path forward by May 1st, 2024. The report will be used in a joint BOE town council workshop to be held on May 15th, 2024. The expectation is that the SBAC will recommend whether a renovation expansion approach, a unified approach, a hybrid approach, or other variations should be the path pursued for the community. So, oh, that's okay. <laughs> so, the, um, so the recommendation would be to change the report due date to June. Let me just make sure I have the dates right again. 
um, June 12th. And then the joint workshop would be, the, the change in that language would be, the joint workshop would be June 26th. All right, so do I have a motion to approve the changes, the amendments to the Building Steering Committee governance document? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor? All right, it's unanimous, thank you. All right, agenda item 9.5 are appointments. 9.5.1 is the, 9.6 is appointments. 9.6.1 is the high school academic life skills teacher. Jeff? Uh, Britt Sautery has been selected to fill this position due to her resignation. She's been working as a paraprofessional at the high school since the beginning of this school year in the academic life skills room and has recently received her special education conditional teaching license. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in social and behavioral science with a concentration in early childhood education from the University of Southern Maine and her special education teacher K-12 certification from University of Maine at Farmington. Ms. Sautery has held a profession, uh, paraprofessional position in uh, Portland Public Schools and behavioral health professional position at Woodford's Family Services. Wonderful. Do I have a motion to approve the high school academic life skills teacher as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Agenda item 9.6.2 is the high school spring athletic coaches. Yeah, there's a lot of names. So moved. <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve the high school spring athletic coaches as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Agenda item 10.0 is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right. All in favor? Thank you so much. Right under the wire. Have a good evening, everyone.